All right, great. So, um, hello, everybody. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this will be the last part of the class. We are done with going through the theoretical side of things on like that ISACA, and we discussed so much about um, the need to really look into multiple aspects and multiple things as well as go through that risk identification, um, response, and all of those things um, within the ISACA framework, right? Uh, at least following the ISACA way of things. But as we mentioned beginning of the class, ISACA is just one methodology, one framework. And um, even though we do not plan on deep diving into a lot of things like the technical know-hows, but what I wanted to kind of do with this class, at least to close on that, on the theoretical side of things, is to introduce other frameworks, especially around the US Gov. And um, we picked the US Gov because even within US Gov, this uh, is just one aspect of things. There are other frameworks, there are other methodologies, and we just plan on covering all of them out of very well, not necessarily all of them, the major uh, frameworks within the US Gov at a very high level. And then um, later on, uh, Fortune will at least deep dive into HIPAA and all of that. I believe that uh, used to be his bread and butter. So um, looking forward to that. But again, on your own, you can honestly look up so many frameworks that exist out there, so many standards, um, risk management methodologies, like things like SOX, uh, PCI DSS, uh, CIS, those have more controls and things like that. But there are so many of them out there. There are always a lot of similarities. All right. So um, what does the US federal government landscape look like, right? We've been hearing of FISMA, FISMA, um, you hear of NEST, you hear of um, CGs, all of these CMMC and whatever. And what we plan to do over here is kind of introduce all of these different kind of risk management frameworks, right? And we will start with, okay, what's going on? Give me a second. Oh, great. Um, actually, let me just put all of them. I didn't realize there is just some form of animation with it. But what I wanted to introduce here is these are some major frameworks that um, kind of we use within the US Gov. And um, looking at number four, I believe everybody is kind of familiar with the FISMA NIST 800-37, which is the NIST RMF process, right? I'm not talking about the 800-53 control, but rather the RMF um, documentation uh, that is 800-37. But then we also have other ones starting from the top. Uh, we have like the FAR, which is the Federal Acquisition um, Regulation. It usually have like 15 controls, uh, a little bit old, but primarily focused on contractors. And basically what it does, it's, um, it identifies all the um, requirements that contractors must meet to work on federal contracts, right? And these are non-sensitive contracts. Um, basically the 15 controls are the minimum controls required. But then again, later on, we'll talk about DFERS within DOD and a little bit about CMMC and those are all towards contractors, but the main basis of those contractor focused um, risk management uh, framework is around FER which is um, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. But then within FBI, this is a smaller one within the Justice Department, you'll hear a lot of sieges, uh, even though it's primarily um, FBI, but at the same time, you would find that certain entities, especially around the law enforcement side of things, they still kind of use it. It's very popular, especially within the Justice Department. But um, sieges is the Criminal Justice Information Service uh started from the FBI division and a lot of law enforcement organizations you'll find them using it and to implement those um it usually have like around 130 controls but it could also be more than that then down to D first so think of the first one first uh FAR but then the D first is more DOD and that's also a uh, focus on con um, contractors but also have around 143 or more controls. Now the most popular one, because the federal civilian uh, 
agencies are pretty much the largest part of the health sector, they use the NIST 800-37. And you'll hear of a FISMA law, or rather the act, which was modernized in 2014. That is one of the um, law requiring the implementation of NIST 800-37. Um, that 37 is a complete separate document with dash 53, right? Dash 37 is the NIST RMF. It's the document that set the tone of what the framework should look like. And it is the document that requires uh, the usage of 800-53 as controls. And one very nuanced thing that sometimes people miss is only federal civilians are expected to follow 800-37. Like cloud service providers do not follow NIST 800-37, they actually follow the federal guidance. But federal guidance also uses the 800-53 controls, which are those same controls that are outlined within uh, to be used within dash 37. Same thing, you start going into um, like the nationals, uh, security systems and all of that. Now, getting on that GSA FedRAM, so with the need to modernize um, came about FedRAM. FedRAM is a body just like there is NIST, but um, FedRAM is within GSA, does the General Service Administration, I believe, and NIST is actually within Com Commerce, right? Department of Commerce. And, FedRAM primarily focuses on cloud service providers and cloud service providers in this sense does not limit it to just major providers like say um, Google, Azure, or AWS. Nope, if you are to build a website today that is considered a SaaS product and it's providing a certain services to the federal um, government, then at least the civilian side, then you do need to comply with FedRAM requirements. What a lot of folks tend to miss also is FedRAM and NIST do have little kind of different uh, situations between them. FedRAM is 100% focused on cloud service providers, not necessarily the end agencies. So you will find that it also comes with certain additional controls. Um, whereas the NIST, again, the NIST 800 37 that agencies are required to implement within their systems um, might not have the same, those additional FedRAM controls, but they do have the option to also include that. That's part of something we call tailoring of controls based on the different systems, right? And you'll hear of the DOD SRG. So just like um, we have the NIST, 800-37 that is meant for end agencies within the federal civilian. We do have, and I'm skipping uh, DISA cloud uh, computing SRG and going to CNSSI on this. We do have similar thing, but focus on the national um, security systems, right? So all agencies that deal with like national security systems, sometimes including the federal civilian agencies do deal with um, uh, national security um, uh, related stuff. As such, they will have to comply with CNSSI. Now, those are also focused on the agencies themselves, whereas cloud service providers that aim to provide services to national security entities, then they do need to follow the cloud um, computing SRG. Just like there is FedRAM for cloud service providers, that are providing services to federal civilian agencies. Same, there is the cloud um, CCSRG that is usually put out by, uh, that was put out by DISR, that um, any cloud service provider that is providing services to DOD specifically um, must comply with, must follow at least. Now the controls used within um, the DOD SRG are also, um, the NIST 800-53, or I will see they're in the process of still moving towards that. One thing with the SRG is that it also provides the requirements uh, 
it follows a little bit similar to the 800-37, but the way you categorize is different. So it, if, even the categorization requirement is a bit separate. That's why you hear of like IL-2, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-6 as the outcome of the categorization if you follow DOD SRG, whereas from a NIST perspective, you hear of low, moderate, high. And even how you put the data to do the categorization itself, it's um, DOD SRG is for following that CIA, CIA, uh, CIA methodology. Same thing with the NIST, but at the same time, how the um, rankings go through is a bit different. That's one major delta between the two. Another difference also involves the fact that NIST have updated the 800-37 to now the Rev2 version which contains the planning section. Uh, they call it prepare. The CCSRG is yet to follow that. Now the CCSRG also outlines the need to use um, uh, controls such as the ones contained within 800-53, but one of the few difference with that also involves, traditionally DOD uses something they call the CCI as identifiers for controls, whereas NIST that don't, doesn't have CCIs. So one of the challenges now from a cloud service provider is having a mapping of those traditional or rather conventional diet of CCIs to current NIST controls following SSRG, oh sorry, CCRG, um, CCSRG, right? Uh, so those things are yet to be fleshed out, but then also the this methodology leverages sometimes the FEDRAM additional controls and um, yeah. Next is we have the MISPOM and now you're starting to get into those um, classified mostly intelligence side of things as well, uh, things above IL-6 and those um, overly controls and things like that. So at a very high level, these are frameworks, or rather I will say risk management um, guidance, major ones within the US Gov. Obviously there are other ones like um, you will hear of CMMC, it's not yet finalized, but it's still in, in talks. You will hear of the NIST, um, uh, there is the NIST cybersecurity framework, NIST CSF, which is, you know, a bit extraction from the 800-37 and even the controls used within NIST CSF, it's basically the same controls as 800-53, but there is a bit of um, kind of um, differences in terms of the identifiers. Uh, another one you'll hear is like the National Archive of Records Administration, there is an executive order that requires putting certain controls towards managing the CUIs there. And um, yeah, then DOD CMMC, there are other ones that you can always look up, but at a very high level, these are some of the most popular ones. All right, let's get into deep dive, at least using NIST as a use case. Started from a law called FISMA that, um, so FISMA, the original, um, the management version was back in 20, no, 2002, and then it got modernized in 2012. That is what calls for the need to have a risk management framework in place within the US Gov federal civilian. Um, DOD traditionally, or I will say US national security traditionally have always had things in place. You will start hearing from Orange Book and all of those kind of old methodologies, even back in the 80s, there are kind of processes in place. So it's just continuously mature. But for the um, civilian side, there has never been an overarching kind of end-to-end -end requirement. You just find different methodologies in place, more like privacy or maybe data security, data sharing and things like that. So FISMA was the first thing that called for having a risk management framework in place from an end-to-end -end perspective for the entire agency. This is beyond technology, beyond cybersecurity, because it also calls for, like that's why within these controls, you have personal controls, you have management control, those things that are non-technical or even, um, yeah, the non-technical controls, like the managerial and operational, even though NIST no longer refers to those controls as that, but there are requirements. That's because it looks at um, 
risk management from an end-to-end -end perspective beyond just um, technology, right? FISMA. And um, when um, with the with FISMA law in place, it calls for NIST to be the agency to draft the documentation, but then there are also other entities involved, like um, it designate um, DHS to be the entity to provide or rather oversee the need for like um, the networking aspect of things. That's why you have like trusted internet connections owned by DHS and driven by that. You have places like OMB also driving some certain guidance, especially around those um, oversight as well as governance. Um, so OMB's kind of guidance is the one that mandates thing, places like GAO to actually go and do the auditing of the entire agency to see if they're in compliance with FISMA. I mean, um, if you read the GAO reports annually, you always find a couple of agencies are really not in compliance with FISMA as they should. And part of that is what is called, so on the NIST side of things, as I mentioned earlier, NIST, um, 800-37 is the document that calls, that pretty much set the policies as well as the framework in place on how to satisfy FISMA, right? And that's where you start getting all of those NIST standards in place and many of those 800 publications, like those 800 series, right? Those are all part of um, how to satisfy 800-37. I love NIST, but the organization of the um, documentation, it can be really daunting unless one have a good understanding of the process. That's why I used to recommend, uh, for this class I did not, but I used to recommend this book. It was uh, written by um, ISC Square on, uh, there's this certification called CAP. It's not up to date, but it does allow one to know where to start, what does the process look like? Beyond that kind of um, cycle we're all familiar with from NIST. Um, in my opinion, 800-37 should not have the same kind of naming convention as say it, the rest of the 800 series because every other 800 series falls under 800-37, right? Um, so yeah, and then you also have those fifth public publications. Um, Basically, they're just a set of standards. Uh, let me give an example. So 800-37 might say uh, something around um, every agency must implement certain controls if they are using a certain type of system. Okay, and 800-37 will say agencies should use 800-53 control. That's 53, uh, documentations as well as the controls contained within 800-53. Now within 800-53, you might come across maybe some SC requirement, uh, secure communications that says, this is how you should secure um, your communications and uh, things like that, including like data encryptions and whatever, maybe secure, um, data at rest or even in transit. None of those documents, which like the 800 series will talk about which encryption standard is approved. It's allowed to be used. So then you start getting into those FIPS publications. So FIPS publications are the ones that will set the standard. Within FIPS publication is where you will find that the US government approves the usage of like RSA or maybe AES um, encryption algorithm, uh, those kind of things around certain criteria that tools must satisfy are all contained within FIPS publications. And um, that's why sometimes they keep getting updated continuously, right? So let's touch a little bit on FedRAM. As I mentioned earlier, FedRAM provides pretty much a standard approach to um, security authorizations, assessments, continuous monitoring, all of those things we learned. Um, FedRAM provides a standard approach for cloud service providers, right? Um, so every single provider, be it large, small, that is 
trying to um, serve the US government. At least the federal civilians must be in compliance with federal uh, requirements. And that's why you hear certain service providers have um, reached maybe federal low, federal moderate, or even federal high. There's a bit difference. Um, while agencies receive ATO, cloud service providers receive PATO, provisional ATO, because the final ATO that a cloud service provider will receive is usually from the consumer, not the regulator. That's the work of um, Fedram. So looking at it from where did Fedram falls in like all of these. So let's think of um, just high level cloud uh, kind of models and deployment models, right? You have the concept of infrastructure, platform, and a software, right? Now, as a cloud service provider, those abstractions do exist. But when it comes from a consumer side perspective on deployment and everything within a cloud environment, of a cloud environment, we tend to have like a private cloud, a public cloud, community cloud, and a hybrid cloud, right? Within US Gov, at least when it comes to cloud service providers, there are certain requirements that makes US Gov clouds completely separate from any single cloud. So when I say any single cloud, I meant commercial cloud. So if Coca-Cola today as an organization is using AWS and let's say IRS is also using AWS, their environments will differ all the way down to the data center because US government part of be it NIST, FedRAM, DOD, and whatsoever all have a data isolation requirement. So all of those data centers will be completely separate. Now that makes a US government cloud kind of you hear like Azure Cloud or even AWS Gov. Uh, there is also Azure Gov and all of those. Those Gov clouds are more community cloud truly because they are meant for the US Gov community, right? And that's why it usually falls into place. And that's, FedRAM tends to authorize that. They tend to authorize the US Gov clouds. Now, they also do look into um, like say public clouds and all of that, but most times there uh, you find um, Cloud service providers use FedRAM to get authorized for their US Gov community cloud uh, provider uh, that they are providing. Now, um, obviously, from a consumer standpoint, US Gov can decide to deploy it again as well um, in whatever fashion they want, be it make it their own public cloud as again within just the US Gov community. So you pick a place like say login.gov where login.gov, it's within the community cloud, like it's hosted within say um, government cloud, but at the same time, it provides services to the entire government community, right? Um, also, they can make it hybrid, a form of the community and their personal environment, or I will say like their private em environment. They can make it 100% a private cloud, um, you will hear a lot um, from like, especially national securities and intelligence, you hear a lot of private cloud deployment. Yes, it is owned and managed by a service provider like Microsoft or AWS, but it's still a private cloud because it's limited to those, probably even a specific agency, right? And all of those do exist. Now, switching a little bit back to that NIST 800-37, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of us are familiar with this image, but these are like the steps, at least visualizing the document in itself, it usually have these six or seven steps, right? We're all used to calling it the six steps, so I actually appreciate starting the count from zero. It's a recent update, or I would say it's almost two years that um, 800-37 was updated from Rev1 to Rev2. But um, it starts from planning, categorizing the system, and all of those. And if you look at this, it basically resembles what we did related to ISACA. We started 
from risk identification. But before you do that, it requires a lot of planning and all of that. And part of that risk identification, we mentioned what are your assets, what are your systems, what is the risk level of those systems, what are the existing threats, how, what are the likelihoods, doing all of those analysis where we mentioned you can do a lot of risk um, identification as well. Those are all part of like plan, right? Then we mentioned risk assessment, which will now start getting into that categorizing because you're categorizing the information system, but at the same time determining the risk level, right? Because the outcome of categorizing a system will be, if you're looking at it from just NIST and FedRAM, it will be a low, moderate, or high. If you're looking at it from DOD, it's like IL2 through IL6. Impact level, those are all categorization and determination of risk level. Same thing we mentioned that um, within the ISACA approach, right? Where you are now doing a risk assessment and the outcome of that risk assessment is to know how you responded that risk, right? Then we get into the risk response where you are now either mitigating, implementing controls or whatever. Again, looking at this, selecting the controls and implementation of controls, right? It's now part of that risk response. Now, once you respond to the risk, we mentioned there is then getting into, um, oh, actually part of responding to the risk and everything we keep talking about the need for the entire business alignment and the need for accountability and responsibility where someone must own the risk and all of that. That's part of, I will say, authorizing the information system, right? Receiving the ATO, the final approval. Before we do that, we will go through like the assessment to make sure all the risk identified has been responded to accordingly in a fashion that we are all in agreement with, right? Um, then after the approval, we get into continuous monitoring, just like we mentioned earlier and during the ISAC, the fourth part, which is risk monitoring right here as well you continuously monitor the res um the controls you implement to respond to the risk and obviously it's a life cycle so as you look at these irrespective of a fra the framework you're going through you will find that there are certain alignment within the different frameworks how it is broken down doesn't necessarily matter because Starting from identifying the risk, managing the risk, responding to the risk, assessing the risk, and continuously monitoring it. And obviously, depending on organization, depending on that part of the tailoring and business alignment and everything, there will always be a way to tweak it, uh, to customize it or to a specific industry, specific sector, like in this case, to US government, right? Maybe if you take this and try to apply it within the financial sector, it might not be applicable one-to-one. -one. Even within his curve, I assure you, it's chaotic to say all security, how you respond to a risk within same, uh, sorry, within different agencies is one-to-one. -one. Absolutely not. I always give example of like, you will not expect how maybe national security organizations, CDOD and the IC community, like ICs to respond to risk in the same fashion as like Library of Congress, right? But they're all within USGov. That's why um, NIST process is very fluid and I would say driven by agencies and highly customizable, but at the same time, it's what makes it chaotic. Um, especially when it comes to transferring skill set, right? If you, <laughs> I know that some of us have come through, gone through this, where you find someone has deep experience. They've been within, say, DOD or maybe uh, one of these intel places for like decades. They've been working there, and they now maybe move to like Department of Treasury, and you find their way of going through ATO, it's a complete kind of challenge to everybody because they are now maybe using their knowledge and how to within the, that they are used to within DOD and putting it within treasury and that's not the same culture, right? Same methodology. Doesn't mean there is a right or wrong. It just means that different agencies have a different 
culture when it comes to um, risk management frameworks. And sometimes that's what makes it chaotic. So um, I know if I'm to open the floor, a lot of people have a lot of stories, but we will move on. <laughs> so yeah, um, looking at this, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have the prepare, categorize, it's just aligning to this. But one interesting thing that you will see is around the different publications that you can leverage to use to um, understand how to go through this. So if you're trying to plan, obviously it will be starting from the NIST 800-37, but if you want to categorize a system, there are documentations that allow you to do that. One of those is the FIPS 199. Sometimes people call it FIPS 199 report. That's the document that guides categorizing. But before that also, uh, in addition to that, there is there are actually two of them, the 800-60 Rev 1 and Rev 2, sorry, Volume 1 Rev 1 and Volume 2 Rev 1, right? Um, those all help you with categorizing the system. Uh, one sets the tone on how to do it, and the other kind of lists the different recommended categorization levels depending on the different sectors within the US GAAP and the type of data. As you get into selecting your um, security controls, that's where you start getting into 800-53, uh, which is the most popular document because it has all the controls listed. Uh, you use that to basically select applicable controls. Um, you leverage also the FIPS 200, which sets some guidelines on the type of tools that you should use like I was mentioning earlier, encryption algorithm, for example, if you want to know what is the approved standard to be used, then you go to FIPS 200 to look into that. Same thing if you want to know what are the conditions of password, not the complexity, because complexity is driven by agencies. It's a control requirement around like IA5. But if you want to now begin to see, does it need to be salted? If yes, um, does it need to be hashed? What should be the hash algorithm and all of that? They're all listed within FIPS uh, 200, where if like you need hashing, you will start looking at like sharp, uh, probe and things like that, right? Um, implementation, there's really no single document on how to implement a security control because NIST is not a provider of that. It, it depends on the tool you're using, as we mentioned earlier. If you are using Okta, to implement single sign-on, then Okta will have a guidance on how to implement that. If you are using, I don't know, Aja Active Directory for that, then Aja has its own way of that. Um, whatever it is, if you are doing encryptions, um, depending on the type of, let's say, data at rest, if you are using a native kind of, uh, say, within Windows using BitLocker, there is a different way to do it. If I think Mac has its own, I can't remember the name, but the Mac OS, um, is it something involved? If you are leveraging that for um, data at rest, it's a different way, even if you're using a third party tool, right? Um, assessment of security controls is also driven by, to know what to look is different with how to do the assessment. So there is a document, just like um, we have a document that list out all the controls that allows you to select the A for that document. So that is 800-53A provides a way to assess those controls, all of them. Now, it doesn't say how to assess the control because it doesn't even know which control, uh, which technology you use to implement, but it does highlight what to look for. So let's keep, let me use an example. In step three, if you're using Okta as a single sign-on solution to implement um, maybe single, like single sign-on and multi-factor authenticator, the 800-53A document will not tell you where to go within Okta to look for um, the implementation if it is done correctly. However, it will tell you like, try putting a username and password and see if you log in. If it allows you to log in, then MFA is not uh, implemented. There's no multi-factor authenticator. And if multi-factor authenticator is enabled, is it text-based? Is it um, a one-time password-based or whatever? Then these are the things you should look for, right? And it also 
identifies, it helps with looking into what loopholes might exist relating to certain implementations. So let me also give an example. Um, if you set a username and password, and you allow the password to be, maybe you just put it, I don't know, 10 characters, and based on those 10 characters, someone can maybe try to log in unlimited. They will just keep trying it. That's a form of a, so meaning there is a vulnerability there, or maybe there is a possibility of a brute force attack, right? 800-53A will let you know to look in to make sure that you have a limit on the number of tries that you are allowed to do, to um, do within um, password attempts, basically, right? Even though within step two, there is a dedicated control. I think it's IE5-2 or so that allows for, um, that calls for the need to have a limit on password attempts. Authorization of a system, <laughs> um, that's where you start dealing with the AO, the authorizing official to get basically a signature, right? After all of those uh, have gone through. Usually assessment is done by third party, or maybe um, the assessment team, depending on how you see if you're getting an external auditor or if it's an internal kind of audit team, but it's usually a separate team be, uh, other than the system owner or even those that do the implementation. It's usually a completely separate team, right? And that's most times the compliance team handles that and they will make a recommendation to the authorizing official now. At least we should, I mean, depending on the quality of the team, the authorizing official should make sure his, um, his entire team actually, not the assessment team, are reliable, but it doesn't mean they wouldn't do their due diligence. So, and then after that, if this system has been authorized, then we get into monitoring, which we kind of discuss also in the ISACA process. You don't just leave everything as it is. Uh, you continuously monitor it to ensure good security posture, right? So at a very high level, what type of tools are used to go through all of these? I know we keep talking. So it depends. A very common statement you'll hear when dealing with ATOs and RMF and all of that. So it depends, it depends. But you do need, has a lot of documentations, can be very annoying. Um, at least within the DOD, uh, one could say that the process is a bit more standardized than it is um, in the federal civilian. Um, at least within the documentation of DOD, everybody must, well, I wouldn't say must, but most uh, agencies follow the SCTM approach. Uh, so at least the SSP uh, controls are not listed in there and all of those um, a bit different either way. And also within DOD, at least there is a tool that most agencies use, like EMAS, um, whereas in the federal civilian agencies, truly there's no one single tool. It just depends on which agency. Uh, some use RSE Archer, some of them also use EMAS, some have their exacta, uh, some don't even have anything. They just rely on SharePoint for their documentations and everything, right? And including managing the points. What formats are being used uh, when delivering those documentations and those um, deliverables? Again, could be word processing, but then also on the tool side, it could, OSCAL is a new thing coming out of FedRAM, but overall I've been there, ARF and all of those um, around tools. Uh, we're all used to X. Um, LS around Excel documentations, but it just depends. Some have markdowns, it all depends. Dashboarding is very popular within the government, especially on the executive side, because it really takes all the noise out and just put a focus on what at least those executives really want to see. And there are a lot of dashboard tools. ServiceNow is very popular. Um, the uh, service now as an organization are positioning themselves as a GRC provider, but they are more just, uh, I will say they are mostly a ticketing kind of thing, but they do have those dashboarding capabilities and tracking that is quite good. It's very popular. Tableau has, has been used uh, as a data 
kind of like consumer. So there are a lot of data feeds that can be put into Tableau and then you customize it. Uh, another tool is Power BI. Maybe I'm selling Microsoft products now, who knows? <laughs> and um, I mean, there are all tools out there. Obviously, Archer also has its own kind of dashboard. Exacta does, um, you must not as much. Or uh, implementation tools. So now when we get to that, how do you implement? Um, that's where you do sometimes manual implementations. Uh, there are sticks. Those are all tools. Uh, within Azure, we have what we call Azure Blueprint. I believe um, we have Terraform for like uh, CI CDs. Uh, secure deployments, automated deployments are also common practices. Different tools allows for that. Um, within AWS, they have their templates that you get to customize and all of that. But then you also get to do your own custom scripts. If or maybe leverage another. I tend to like um, SANS, especially um, when you're dealing with like Windows systems, SANS tend to provide a lot of resources and scripts uh, that allows you to kind of do a lot of implementation, right? Uh, once you start getting to that monitoring side of things and aggregation, we mentioned um, SIM tools, right? A very popular one is Splunk, now within the entire industry really powerful tool. Uh, log analytics, we have that within Azure. I'm not really competent as much with that of AWS, but also within your local system, you can extract your logs and you know, create your own little tool and alerting capabilities. But those are all different SIM tools that you can use to continuously monitor your environment, your systems. Um, Keep in mind that it might not necessarily provide an end-to-end -end view of your entire system or even your environment. So there could be parts where you might need to supplement. Um, but yeah, Splunk is quite powerful in that. Another, I mean, there is really no one single tool that provides end-to-end, -end, but there are some tools that are very mature and providing more capabilities. And Truly within DoD, EMAS is, another, is one system. Is it the best to provide end to end? Truly, there's no best to proceed. Um, but it's quite, I would say, it is to serve as a repository in the sense that you get to just do your actions within it and also store the documentation. So I would actually say it serves beyond being a repository, right? Because you do get to mark your controls in there and everything, but it doesn't do things like secure deployments. You wouldn't do monitoring in there, none of that. Um, Exacta, it's, it's a great tool, a challenging one because it's highly customizable. I guess they are trying to get a the bigger market, very popular within the intelligence sector, but then also popular within other federal civilian organizations. Um, it doesn't have a strict workflow, so it provides that customization that is needed within RMF. Unlike EMAS, it kind of have a very strict workflow that is more customizable, like that it's not customizable, it's more DOD centric. And even within DOD, you'll find there are a bit differences because like the army is different with like see the Navy, Maybe they have these things they call the uh, um, NQVs. They don't use what they call, um, they don't use scores. They have, um, but they don't use con security control assessors. Rather, they use something called NQVs, like the Navy qualified validators. And those are all nuances that you still don't get as much within emails, but at least provide the seamless workflow um, end to end. You don't get to customize that. Exactly, you do get to customize it. So it requires a high, I would say it requires superior knowledge of the process just so you can use Exacta. But then Exacta is more on the, like it's a private organization, whereas DOD is, sorry, EMAS is owned by DOD, created by Buzalem, owned by DOD. Exacta is a, third party, non-US Gov owned. So maybe they're trying to target a much larger market. Um, RSA Archer, it's a commercial off the shelf product, really powerful, um, but it's not specific to like say US Gov 
Uh, that's not actually their primary market. Um, the financial sector uses it a lot. Um, different sectors actually use RSA Archer, but it's a really great tool. So um, same company as the uh, um, same company founded by the same three folks that kind of founded the RSA encryption algorithm. Uh, it's a security company. It used to be part of Dell. I don't know if they are still part of it. I used to work with them way back, but yeah. Um, assessment tools. There's really no single assessment tool. It depends from are you assessing the network? Are you assessing the application? Are you what exactly are you assessing, right? If you do if you did a stick deployment, there are so many tools out there that allows you to check the compliance state of your stick. There is a popular one called the S, uh, SCAP SCC, on, also by DISA. I think it was created by DHS and now managed by DISA, but it's like the most simplistic free tool to kind of um, run to check your stick compliances. But then also there are a lot of vulnerability scanners. If you're checking the network and at the infrastructure and all of that level, non-application, Nessus is very, very popular. It's um, one of the major tools, especially because it has CVE tags, uh, because CVEs are more like the standardized unique identity for um, unique identifier for different vulnerabilities, right? And BobSuit is a web application scanner. So at the application layer, BobSuit is also a very popular tool. I like it. Um, but there are also a lot of free tools. It depends. Uh, like Vulnerita is another. One great thing with Nessus and BobSuit, at least within the government side, it's because they have all achieved federal um, authorization. So they are very common within the government space. Uh, additional monitoring tools, I mean, it depends. You can build your own custom one, Azure Monitor. Everybody will tell you monitoring side of things can be the most, it's the easiest yet the most, you know, annoying, I will say, because it's just the same thing, you know, going into those security operation center and continuously looking into logs to look for it, um, outliers. So, Everything I mentioned, what does the journey look like from an end-to-end -end perspective? This is just at a very high level. As you're doing your planning, that's when you will, at the very high level, identify the categorization, identify inheritance, uh, the systems, and all of those. Uh, design your boundary, finalize architecture. Again, this is not an implementational view that is applicable to everybody. It's just a high level. Um, that you will find is common across. Now, different places might switch how they do things, but especially around the artifacts and documentation, um, there are entities that actually don't really do things like e-authentication or even PTA, a PTA and PIA, it depends on the type of data, like the privacy threshold uh, assessment and the privacy impact assessment, they are all, Data driven. If you're dealing with uh, PIIs, uh, FIPS 199 is the output of that categorization, SON, SSPs, and all of that. As we mentioned, there is like SCTP, uh, sorry, SCTM, which is common within DOD, but you see I did not list that it, um, in there. So th this is not one to one, things can change. But the normal process is you do the technical things, the technical folks handle that. The person doing the documentation gathers all of those, do the processes, uh, and then submit the submit the entire package. And then part of the package there could be not everybody does IVMV like the verification and validation, which is more internal. But at least everybody must do some form of assessment. You can see I wrote FCA there, the security control assessment. But I was just mentioning that like within DoD, the end the person doing that is not called a security control assessor, it's called the Navy Qualified Validator. That's what they do uh, in place of like assessment, right? After that, um, gather all of those. So technically you actually submit the evidence before the assessment, it just depends. But yes, you submit the evidence before the assessment and then 
um, do the assessment, at the outcome of the assessment, you will find some findings. Um, or I will say the security um, control assessor or the auditor or the 3PO or NQB will, will do the assessment and there could be some findings. Uh, sometimes they will tell you to fix those findings, that's the remediation, or they will um, kind of uh, issue AORs and push those findings into POEMs, so the system will still be authorized, but then POEMs in this case, more like a risk register from our last ISACA uh, lectures, right? And then you keep tracking those, uh, reply to them, and uh, based on that, the assessor will make a recommendation for authorization and that goes to the authorizing official. They do their review and they sign it. So like an end-to-end -end journal, as you can see, there should be additional step at the end that gets everything into the monitoring side, which um, if you are in a consultant, you know, most folks after the authorization, they're out of it. Some are out of the project, and then you get into O and M. But that's where the main money is, I guess, for consulting firms because those operational maintenance goes for years. The contract to do that, but yeah, this is just a generic view, high level from an end-to-end -end perspective. But obviously, it's um, customizable and different depending on the agency. And this brings us to the end of today's um, session. Any questions? So I, I have a question. Could you go back to the um, slide that had all of the tools, the assessment tools? So the risk management tools, yes. So, I, and I don't know, maybe it's a rhetorical question. I know that the Internet of Things, the act that was signed, the executive order that was signed is supposed to make um, software vendors, supply chains uh, divulge the vulnerabilities within their tools. I just, I don't know if there's a little irony in this. The programmer records, like for DOD, we're forced to use certain tools. Um, when those tools to assess risk are risky themselves, for lack of better terms, <laughs> Or when you are unable to secure your network because you're bound by programmer records that are outdated. What, I mean, I guess what, maybe this is a question for a dissertation, but what is the, what you all see in the industry going on with that? Like, am I the only one seeing that in, in my work? I'm just curious because it's just, I laugh at it. I'm looking at like Azure and we all see open source, you know, solar winds. Azure, mm -hmm. I mean, Windows prints fuller, print nightmare. I mean, just, yeah, patch this. It doesn't work, there's issues. What do we do when it's just impossible to assess the risk or the risk is the tool we're using over? So, um, seriously, a very great question. And I'm honestly also looking forward to this new committee that was set for cybersecurity around um, responsible disclosures. Uh, yeah. to see what you come out with. Yeah, because um, that vulnerability disclosure within a time frame in itself could be an issue when the, uh, when the vulnerability has not been remediated. And even much more of an issue when the vulnerability, as you mentioned, is related to the control you're using, right? The main tool in itself. And while I don't have a direct answer, I would say this brings us to, I don't know if you can remember, in the lectures when you were saying, every time you make a decision of a control, the control in itself could introduce vulnerabilities. I was given an example of, you could decide to replace or update the lock in your front door to something of a biometric, and then that could also bring about additional vulnerabilities. It's a continuous process. And I wouldn't necessarily say you can get rid of um, uh, risk completely. However, from, from a professional standpoint and best practice, the idea is that you look at the existing controls and vulnerabilities that you have, and you look, sorry, you look at the existing processes that you have, and then you also look at what you are introducing new as that control in itself, and you make a risk-based decision. So in this scenario, you know, kind of 
uh, the example you gave, I will honestly say you have to look at it with the lens of should you be using the control in itself? Because probably if you use the control, the risk is much higher than not using the control. And it's a possibility. So I guess I'm like you. There is no one single way of doing it. With programs, however, I think that is much more of a government culture. And I can't believe I'm saying it, but it's slow for our program and processes to be updated compared with the industry. So you always find that, I guess that's what they call bureaucracy, right? <laughs> but yeah, those processes will tend to take a while, I guess. So I don't have an answer, but I'll open the floor for others to see if they do. Anybody? The only thing that you can do is, is get your risk down to an acceptable level and go and uh, you know brief for 14 or 15 that you know this is where we're at this is where we're going to stay based on operational requirements and the tools that we use right i guess then to add to her question on that it's once you bring it down to an acceptable level and you decided that this is the control you're going to use then you begin to assess the control in itself it also has its own vulnerabilities what do you do if removing the control increases yeah does it does it increase more does it add more risk right that's, that's, yeah that's what i was thinking as well initially and then what what category of risk right like we, we can go down that rabbit hole right yeah it's a trade-off <laughs> well yeah I, good copy and i wish i could go to the 14 or 15 but i'm in that position so i'm trying to answer the higher-ups but so just I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but what I did was I increased the periodicity of the scanning and the audit reviews and to accept that risk. But I mean, that's just a scary thing, um, especially when you talk about DOD, like using things that you know um, there might be a proof of concept or, you know, and of course we do our poems, our plan of action and milestones, but those things can go on forever. So I was just trying to see, you know, yeah, there's Approved no product list, all these things, program of record, man, this is, this is, this is stress. There is a reason there's a lot of jobs available in cybersecurity. A lot of times the answer is just try to do the best you can. But thank you accept it and smile. Yeah. 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 <laughs> One thing though. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I've noticed about the vulnerabilities that exist in the actual core tool set. They usually require the fact that you don't need best practice. So even with the solar winds tool, if you did not have it internet facing and you had it faced only on the internet, you wouldn't have been impacted by it. It needs a beacon to get out. So even with the tool sets that have vulnerabilities, a lot of them are mitigated through best practice. The problem is though, that a lot of when you implement best practice for tool sets, like if you go to the Cisco page, it'll give you a list of things you're supposed to do. A lot of sys admins don't do all those things because it makes their job harder. <laughs> and you just don't have the time and resources to do them, do them all. But I've always found that when I was doing capture the flag competitions or other things where I had to get onto a network remotely, if someone went through and actually did all the things, it was extremely hard to try to get onto that target. That's, that's what I concur, I Misty. I mean, that's I why we were putting the <laughs> audits on them so we could catch, for lack of a better term, I hate to say catch the system administrators, but you're right. It was uh, misconfigurations, lack of doing all the best practices and you're, you're absolutely right. And so through increasing the audits and the scanning, um, we flushed out a lot of that, but even still, I mean, yeah, thanks. Uh, Are you at Paycom by the way? Just to point, um, to add to Mitch's point on um, that, I was actually about to make a comment on, sometimes we do have the concept of that defense in depth and like layered defense. Um, I mean, it's not a new thing. And that's why sometimes I tend to love when people say like, well, there are still VOD systems that are still running Windows XP and whatever. I'm like, yeah, but the risk is that to those systems are considered from external sources and good luck trying to get into those networks. Probably your regular device might not even get to those networks, right? It's like maybe link 16, maybe it's beyond even tick connection. So I think sometimes it depends on also the rings, right? Like you look at it from a ring perspective, which 
where is that vulnerability you talk of? And then from a layered approach, truly what are considered those, what are those threats to that? And I know with now cloud issues, that is where it's becoming much more challenging, unlike like back in the days, you know, regular on-prem. Uh, maybe you find even the system is now operating on a TCP IP um, uh, protocol. So as such, you completely need to have access to some highly customized different, uh, maybe say DOD centric protocol. Then in that case, you begin to see, okay, maybe I will be able to accept the risk at this level. I mean, I think if we have the answer to these questions, then yeah, cyber security wouldn't be what it is right now. <laughs> but yeah, anyone? I think someone was trying to say something. Yeah, um, Dr. Wizier, I, I agree with um, you know the conversation. You can never, I mean, I've seen so many clients that put controls in place but you know they, they and they think they're monitoring properly but these controls after a while aren't doing what they were expected so it's all about that security profile that you set to ensure you stay within that profile there's a lot of tools out there not just sims but even artificial intelligence on top of the sim which uh sets a certain threshold and if the control is not doing the job it should be doing then it could auto it automatically or Give you a recommendation of what needs to be done so it's really about continuous auditing to ensure that on day one when you set that control uh you know after the 12th month where the auditor comes in to see what's going on you have reports to indicate that you didn't veer away from the current profile that was set to ensure that you can check off all the boxes for your regulations your compliance whatever the case may be um, but the problem still exists where individuals um, they believe security is a set it and forget it, and they don't continuously monitor or continuously audit the environment. That's the problem. You could you put so many tools in front of them, yet they don't follow the recommendations of some of the, um, you know, some of the professionals that tell them what to do. I agree with you. And these are all, I think we should, I should have added a conversation around this topic. And this is all under the assumption and we are focusing on the tool in itself. Now, what if the risk is coming from the tool provider themselves? Let me give a couple of examples. We all heard of, you know, how back in the days, I mean, not just far along, like the US government uses Kaspersky uh, and it's a Russian tool. And then you look at China is now saying, you know, any non-Chinese device is going to, uh, is no longer going to be used within their governments, right? Like, so HP and all of these devices, they probably will take them out because everybody is now thinking, you know, it could be the provider themselves, not really the tool. So there are so many tool providers out there. Guess what happens with that? I mean, there's a lot. Anyone? This would have been a very good um, weekly discussion, but there's only so much we can have. But yeah, uh, good point bringing this up, Frida. Any other question, anybody? Anyone wants to share similar challenge within like the industry, non-gov? I know we tend to drive it from a government side of things in this class. Yes, that's my fault, but hey. Anybody that is not within the US gov wanna all right. Um, why don't we take 15 minutes break and then come back at eight? And um, just like I went over news at a very high level, Fortune will kind of go over HIPAA and what is HIPAA, the controls, and all of that. And uh, we'll call it a day. So, should we take uh, 15 minutes and come back at 8 p.m.? Recording and I'll share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? It's loaded. All good. Yep, good here. Yes, you can. Great. Okay, everyone. As you already know, um, my name is Fortune Enrique. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate here um, in cybersecurity at Marymount University. And today I want to do a little bit of a deep dive uh, with you all in uh, around HIPAA 
which is Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which is a, a healthcare framework that's used around, you know, patient data is basically used around protecting patient data and all that good stuff. So we're gonna go through a series of different things about HIPAA, the healthcare industry, the background of HIPAA, and also um, uh, just to have a better understanding about PHI, uh, EPHI. Um, we'll talk a little bit about implementing healthcare and HIPAA assessments. And just to let you know, I have a, 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 a pretty solid background, which is my bread and butter, um, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Watzeri uh, said earlier. Um, I've been in the HIPAA and healthcare industry uh, before I got to Microsoft. So that was really my background around healthcare security. Uh, I have my certifications around that. I'm EPIC certified, which is like an electric, uh, electric EMR and medical record. Epic Security Certified, I have the ISC Square certification around healthcare, which is the HCISPP and all that great stuff. And I have a degree and master's in healthcare informatics and uh, security and all that great stuff. So let's go ahead and get started. The objective, the first objective will be understanding cybersecurity frameworks and functions. Second, we'll understand the healthcare environment and HIPAA. And third, we'll talk about how to implement an effective HIPAA assessment within your organization. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about the healthcare framework and uh, functions. These are the different functions that you see. Um, it's a range of different things. It's a range of different things, uh, which is you can look at it from five. You can look at it from different standpoints. It's the NIST CSF 800 171 it consists of five core functions, 22 categories, and 98 subcategories. Um, and these are different controls that we basically measure against. You have uh, the identify. I identify section, you have protect, protect, respond, recover, and all these different things um, are used. Has anybody in class ever, you know, done an assessment uh, against these different frameworks? Uh, I know a lot of my past experience has been around, you know, these doing this assessments, doing HIPAA assessments against these frameworks. So there's a particular, there's a particular things you are have to look for in these different organizations in terms of actually identifying, like for instance, for example, identifying asset management. Well, basically, when you're trying to, you know, go against those security uh, frameworks or when you're trying to go against them, you're basically trying to see, do you have a true asset inventory? Do you, do you have accountable system owners and uh, system, system owners and asset owners who actually know that these systems belong to them? So that's one example. Um, you have different processes here that you're trying to implement and improve on, access control. So if you look at it from a healthcare standpoint, do you have access controls in place? Uh, from a healthcare standpoint, can nurses see what physicians are supposed to see? Can physicians see what pharmacists are supposed to see? They're, these are different access controls that you're supposed to have in place, especially around healthcare when it comes down to, you know, patient data. There's only so much access that's allowed for a certain person. And not even just healthcare related. If you look at it from a general perspective, you know, access control is very important. Uh, there's people who have privileged access and stuff of that nature. So these are the different controls that you need to see. And when you're ranking them, you're ranking them from a, from a high, medium, and low standpoint, I know we're familiar with that, but there's different ways of how to actually rank them, which we could talk about later on when we have a discussion. But I guess I just want to ask the class, um, um, on your organizations, do you guys basically have, in different organizations you are a part of, do you guys have any type of cybersecurity assessment or control that you're measuring against? Anybody want to speak? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, um, I do with a lot of different clients. So, I mean, I... I I span the, the the vector or the um, uh, the industries of you know healthcare, finance, uh, retail. So there's a lot of different frameworks we use. But you're right though, uh, you know the identify, protect, attack, respond, recover, being very focused on uh, even right now supply chain supply chain risk management. A lot of my retailers they want to know about that because a lot of their cloud providers or cloud partners. How do they know that, you know, where's the weakest link in making sure that their PCI information is not lost? So there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, skin the cat here, but there's a lot of different control families you're presenting here. So it all depends on, you know, where the weakness lies within your, your client, obviously. Yeah, P PCI, thank you for that. I 100% agree. PCI is a great, uh, a great example, uh, payment card industry where you're basically measuring against financials. That's a great example. Anybody else have anything to say about these different functions or are you guys, are you guys actually actively in your organizations or have you actively in the past, past experience, have you actively measured against these security controls? Um, do you guys actually do quarterly or have some type of 
some type of cadence on these assessments, or maybe you don't do it at all. Maybe just maybe your first time seeing it. Fortune, I actually have one question. Um, it's sure. not related to the monitoring you mentioned. It's more around the controls. So does HIPAA use the 800-17, these controls, like um, from 800-171 as the main ones, or are you allowed to look into other frameworks and controls? Uh, in the past, this is, these are the controls that we actually look at. This is actually what we measure against. Um, but we're, we're, we're using it from a lens of a uh, healthcare, healthcare lens. So it's against the healthcare assets that we own, it's against healthcare patient data and stuff of that nature. These are the controls that we are using and measuring against when we do HIPAA security assessments. Got it. Thanks. And um, for just, just to add to that, uh, sometimes I'm working with healthcare clients. Some of them have no frameworks what to speak to speak of, and they, they confuse them. Uh, you know, compliance with security and privacy, which all three are different. So what we do is we try and build them a framework based on perhaps the NIST cybersecurity framework, but we map it to HIPAA uh, requirements based on their um, on their auditing for compliance purposes. So you can you can mix the two, but at the same time you have to have some kind of framework, whether it be HIPAA by itself or if you want to establish a security privacy framework, you could follow a NIST as well and, and just map map the uh, the categories as well. Yeah, that's correct. I, that's also an option. Absolutely. And going on to our next slide, <clears throat> I think that was a great segue into our next slide. You you mentioned earlier that um, some healthcare organizations don't have a framework, um, and some organizations, just to be honest with you, uh, I was also a consultant. I know you guys had a discussion over there. I was a consultant at a a uh, pretty, pretty mid-sized company, pretty big company. They were a billion dollar company, um, somewhat well known. And uh, I did assessments for a lot of different industries, financial industries, energy, healthcare. And something that I really ran into comments that healthcare is just lagging behind. So when we talk about, when we talk about lagging behind, they just don't take security serious. Um, they just don't take their technology environment serious just for a simple fact that that's not their first priority on. So their first priority is patient care. It's protecting their life, saving their life, uh, healing somebody. That's their first priority. So therefore, everything else, uh, everything else related that's non-related to that takes a back seat. Back seat. There's a secondary. It's a secondary uh, movement. So with that being said, I have a chart here that uh, was identified by IBM and uh, got from this different resource from this recent article, which is came straight from the report. It says the average total cost of a data breach by industry is six point at 6.45 million and healthcare seems to be number one. I always tell people that if you can understand, and this is my personal opinion, I always tell people because I did it before, if you can if you can master, if you can master a healthcare environment, cybersecurity environment, you can pretty much handle almost any industry. I say that because healthcare is the only well, I say that because healthcare is one of the most complex industry and it's honestly has and holds the most amount of data if you think about it. Your social security is involved. Your first and last name is involved. Your, your phone number is involved. But then also now you talk about your medical diagnosis involved, your prescriptions involved. There's so many different factors into your insurance is involved. There's so many different factors that identifies an individual or in this case a patient that can be used that can be used to basically leverage whoever the bad actor is or whoever's trying to gain or gain access or gain that le leverage. So that's why healthcare is attacked so much because one, it's behind and it's just lagging behind in technology because that's not their main focus, although it's getting better and it's improving. But two, um, it just holds an ample amount of data that's so valuable for anybody that's a bad actor to leverage. So let me talk about, does somebody have a question? Yeah, of course. Sorry, I have a question for you actually. Sure. What are your thoughts on this are with regards to all the, the breaches that are occurring right now on a, on a healthcare perspective? Um, you know, it's almost like a hybrid war because when a healthcare industry or healthcare, uh, I guess a hospital is breached, they, they, they will uh, be affected in trying to uh, service their patients, right? And some have actually, some, a couple of people where they tried to move them over to another hospital because they couldn't service them anymore because they were attacked by a malware or ransomware, uh, died in the, in the process. And that's a big problem. So with that said, do you believe that uh, healthcare industry, the healthcare industry is taking a lot more seriously with regards to breaches that are going on that could affect not only 
information, but also people's lives, because that's that's the, the stark reality of it, unfortunately. Absolutely. Um, to be honest with you, I actually think that once, well, they're starting to catch on because like you said, especially now it's this COVID, COVID has been such a massive increase of, you know, phishing attacks, so many different things, email, uh, email attacks or, you know, things that are trying to, to get nurses or the clinical staff or whatever the case may be to click on the link about during the time where I can Fortune, I think we're losing him. It's getting better. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay, I think. I think we lost. I think it is. There. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah now we can. Okay, yes. Uh, I think it is getting better, but I still think we have a long way to go. Um, the reason why I say yeah. that we still have a long way to go is because we we are still lacking behind. We we don't know what is needed in our security teams or our technology departments. To actually have an efficient, to actually have an efficient, well fluid cybersecurity program in place, but the reason why I think that we're starting to catch on is because we're starting to indirectly find out that hey, cybersecurity can be attached to a patient life. You mentioned, and this is not the first time I heard this. You mentioned that you know somebody lost their life from an attack because they have to get transferred to a different hospital. Or imagine when the physician is working on a patient and all their data is gone, and now they don't know what happened or what was yes. the diagnosis before or the results. So therefore. Indirectly, cybersecurity can have a part to somebody's life. Yeah, absolutely. I do Thank agree. You. No worries. So in that life aspect of change, Next right? thing I want to talk. Hello, question? I have a quick question. Yes. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay. So any part, like, are there cases related to, like, misdiagnosis where you find, um, you know, uh, adversaries are getting into like healthcare systems and changing patient diagnosis. That would be much more of a targeted issue, but is that common? Does it happen? Or that's just a movies kind of thing? Uh, mixed diagnosis? <laughs> uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's really, I, I don't really know if that's common. I haven't heard of that too much, um, but it's something, it's something that I see where your mind's going. It's something that's probably, that's probably happened, but I've not heard of it. Cool. Has anybody else heard of it? Uh, no, you're more sorry, likely I, to have I, like a you're you're more likely to have like a HIPAA spill or something like that than I think a intentional modification of a client record. Yeah, like maliciously done. Yeah, so, yeah and yeah, fortunately, you know, I, sorry, I, I don't mean to apply this conversation, but I I work with a lot of different different companies, and the reason that hackers go after healthcare information is because on the black market. A health, someone's healthcare record is worth $250. Why? Because it includes insurance information. Whereas mm -hmm. a credit card now is a credit card now is worth 50 bucks. Yep, that's that being said, there that being said, there have been issues where they've been sold in the black market, maybe not in the US, but elsewhere. Individuals buy uh, someone's health information. They go to a new doctor with this information, and, and the doctor says, Oh, I see you're allergic to penicillin or morphine, and they go, oh no, that was when I was younger, now I'm okay, and it changes the record. When the real individual goes in, let's say that it's an emergency, and this person is knocked out, and they go into the emergency room and they look up the person's record, which has now been altered, and they apply morphine or penicillin to the individual, they pass away because of that, that's the fear. And actually I heard, um, I heard some healthcare specialists at a conference talk about that once, and I'm like, man, that's scary. And that's just because of, you know, leaked information and sold in the black market. So I think this has to be really taken seriously because of the, the effect of the ones and zeros now affecting a, a human body or, or, or a human. That's the problem. I completely agree. I 100% agree with that. Everything you said, that's completely, that's completely factual for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate, so, really. But yeah. Yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, protect the health information, which is the first thing that we have here is any information that is transmitted or maintained in the medium, including di de demographic information. 
Uh, basically, this is can be created slash received by a covered entity, a business associate, uh, basically related to describe past or present their physical or mental health conditions, past or present or future payments for provision of health care. It can be used to identify a patient. Everything we just named earlier and everything you just named um, earlier was about how, you know, the insurance or social security or day of birth, everything that's used to identify a person, identify a patient or a person, is considered protected health information, which is called PHI. Types of data that we take by HIPAA, these are the types of data that we protect by HIPAA. Uh, I know some people were, I know when I presented this to a, a recent class, I know some people were really confused about number five and number four, but they did not know. But these are the types of data protected by HIPAA. It can be documentation, all paper records. There are some practices, believe it or not, that do not have electronic health records or electronic medical records. They're still on paper record. They're still on papers. I saw as a consultant when I was doing a physical walkthrough trying to assess them on their um, on their security controls to see if they were digital or they were how they were transmitting or processing patient data. Honestly, on top of that, there was a lot of spoken and verbal information, including uh, voicemail, voicemail messages, electronic health. Uh, information which is used on USB memory cards, electronic health data, data, and you have photographic images such as X-rays. Uh, when you're walking by, you know you don't want somebody knowing your X-ray of your body. And audio and video recording, regardless of a surgeon or a physician needs to do that or need that for some type of procedure or surgery. So these are things that are protected by HIPAA. Every single one of these things are HIPAA, and once they're linked, it can be as simple as, oh, your um, your X-ray uh, images was not filed correctly. It was left on the counter and somebody came to visit and you know accidentally picked up the wrong file or something of that nature. I mean, that's 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 invading somebody's privacy, somebody, somebody's health care um, is still being viewed on. So these are all the different things that are types, these are all the different types of data protected by HIPAA in all different forms. Uh, Fortune, I have a, a question. Sure, With, go ahead. Uh, fitness trackers, what do you think? Should they be uh HIPAA? Compliant, should they uh, comply? Like Fitbits, Fitbits, and like any of those fitness exercise uh, apps, because they actually do take your, uh, you know, your personal information or health information. Yeah, I thought they are. I thought they are. They go through a HIPAA HIPAA compliance. All those companies are federally uh, approved at a, at a government level. I'm sure, like. Apple Watches, uh, Fitbits. That's why so there's so many different things when it comes down to uh, internet things, medical devices. All these are considered and go through some type of assessment of how to protect your patient information because that in itself, yes, is protected by HIPAA, HIPAA compliance, all that great stuff. Thanks. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. The next thing I want to get into, uh, I guess before I even start, has anybody here actually went through the process or have ever done a HIPAA assessment? Has anybody ever done one or been through a HIPAA assessment for a client or for uh, a healthcare system? Yeah, yeah, I have, Fortune. Okay. So what were some of the things yeah. that you were looking for? What were some of the processes that you ran um, that you were trying to do to make sure this was a complete HIPAA assessment that your client or the or the healthcare organization that you work for understood where they stand and where their posture was at from a cybersecurity perspective. Well, that's where you know um, doing an assessment. You're looking at first off, we're, we're trying to trying to identify their critical assets, right? Their data, obviously. Um, where is it held? Um, how is it how is it handled? Uh, you know, it, and also different devices that they have within the environment, the ecosystem. And are these devices um, at risk for being um, infiltrated and things of that nature? So if you're, if you're following like a, the, the, the CSF, you know, after they identify, then after that, are they protecting it properly? What are, the, what are the procedures? Are there policies in place for different staff members, whether it be nurses, doctors, administration, and things like that? Um, this, this one in particular was going out to the cloud as well. So data was not just on-prem, but also was dispersed. So visibility, was there visibility within the ecosystem to see what was going on with that data? 
Um, at the end of the day, it's, it was all of, and they also had IOT devices. And some of these were like, you know, proton pumps, morphine drips, things like that. And did they have, and of course we all know IOT devices don't have um, primary controls. So what are the compensating controls? Did they have visibility into that? Was there a SIM? Was there a managed detection response system? And things like that. So all of this was mapped to a compliance sheet that you know you have to do the, you know do the checkoffs for, for HIPAA, but at the same time we wanted to ensure that their environment was secure and private at the same time. Great feedback. Yeah, that's a great way to measure it. Anybody else has any experience? Bro? Well, some of the stuff that I would like to talk about, and if anybody else want to piggyback on it as we go step by step, you know, implementing a HIPAA assessment. I think the first thing you have to do is determine where are we measuring, like what PHI do we have access to? Uh, I know we talked about PHI earlier, like where, where are the data? HIPAA is a, is a data-driven framework to protect the patient data, protect the organization that holds that data. It is a, a data-driven framework. Um, and we have to determine what, what is our, we have to determine what that is. The next thing we have to do is um, assess our current security measures. Like what do we have in place to protect it? Um, are we, for instance, are physicians going between their different practices or their different satellites between their health systems and faxing, you know, faxing documents from one end to another and having cover sheets? Do they have those security measures in place? Are they going to different, are they going to different things such as, you know, such as um, having vulnerability management programs in place, making sure that, you know, they have some type of, some type of timeline or SLA to remediate those vulnerabilities because we know those systems are healthcare systems and those systems within those healthcare systems have been there for ages, legacy systems. Are they being patched? Are they being remediated on a 30, 60, 90 day vulnerability cycle to do stuff of that nature? Where are the current security measures in place to ensure that we're holding the systems that are holding the data? One, to make sure the systems that are holding the data are in place and make sure, and two, if they don't have systems and the use of HIP records, where are they using as mechanisms to ensure that their data is not being leaked? The third one is that we want to identify where you are vulnerable at and the likelihood of those threats. So there's different ways that you want to you want to measure that, and that goes into number four: determine your level of risk. We say all the time, although I'm not a big fan of this, honestly, the the lows, the moderate, the highs, those are the ways that we we rank them. But I'm looking forward. I think and I think the cybersecurity uh, risk management environment is starting to actually move towards this way of getting away from the high, medium, and lows. Uh, determine your risk level. So if I don't do this, how much money is it going to cost X, Y, and Z? What does that look like? What does that formula look like? I think that's the way that we're moving. I think all of security, not even just healthcare, is moving that way. I think healthcare is lagging behind, but I'm looking forward to like, hey, if X, my, if we have 200 data breaches leaked, how much money do we lose? I think once executives and C-suite are under to understand to determine your level of risk, we'll be able to have them put more emphasis and more of a priority into cybersecurity. But for right now, we'll just determine our list level of high, medium, and lows, because that's what we're doing right now from the last time I checked the industry. And then five, finalize your documents. I think finalizing your documents are very important. Um, you need to basically, you need to see what related, what's related to the HIPAA, what's related to HIPAA explained documents that comes out. Like, do we have a business continuity plan in place? Do we have a disaster recovery? If we were to have an outage, could we get our data back of those patients immediately and be able to, you know, provide patient care, which is our, which are, which is our top priority. Which is, can we be able to recover from all these outages? Do we have those process policies and procedures in place for different stuff of that nature from a BC, from a BC or DR standpoint, or even an instant response plan if you're actually under attack? And then we talk again about um, prepare to start again. I think this is very important. This is not a one-time thing. What's the cadence? Are we doing this and reviewing this? quarterly? Are we reviewing it monthly? Are we doing it yearly? Just throwing numbers out there. What's our cadence? And by review, I'm not saying like, hey, we're just glancing at it. Are we getting our security team together within these healthcare organizations or getting these consultant companies to review our documents and see if we're up to date to be able to, to be able to first, to be able to get ahead of these bad threat actors or these malicious act, uh, activities that are going on and become get smarter and wiser and have policies and procedures and steps in place to overcome these attacks. And one and two to make sure that we're actually on accord with these different organ we're we're on core we're on accord as an organization, as a cybersecurity team or IT department, wherever the case may be, or wherever your organization is ranking them. So those are the different steps that I would like to mention for 
one, two, three, four, five, six. These are the six steps that I would say that are important in implementing a HIPAA assessment. I know I said a lot, I was talking a lot, a lot, a lot and I was talking quickly, but do we have any questions about that? Anything that wants to be cleared up or anything that may have been confusing about implementing a HIPAA assessment at different levels and different steps that you need to go through? So how often is it done, uh, if you don't mind, like the HIPAA assessment? Do you know, is it annually uh, every three years? Man, that's a great question. Every organization is different. I've seen organizations that do it once a year. There's some organizations that are very on top of it that may do it twice a year or quarterly. There's some that haven't looked at their, probably haven't looked at their policies and procedures or some of these documents <laughs> in probably three years. You know what? The funny part about it is that there's some who may not even have these documents stored, may not even have it. They just wing it. And something happened, oh, we just usually go to our security team and they just figure it out. It's not documented anywhere. And that's why it's very really important to have documentations in place. So when things like this occur, it's easy to like, it's not easy, but you have at least an understanding of how to overcome it. So there's, that's, a, that's a question that depends on the organization. It could, be, it, could be, it could be yearly. They could not have it. It could be every three years. It just depends. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I actually have another question related to that. Is the industry driven by, is there any governance around that? Um, maybe um, who checks on these um, hospitals and all of these places that needs to be in compliance with HIPAA? Who checks on them to make sure they are implementing the right things? Who checks on them? Whoever checks on them is usually from an audit perspective. So you have some of these consultants and companies who basically, like, I know when I was in one of these industry companies for these local healthcare systems here in Atlanta, Georgia, we all have like KPMG or Deloitte come and do an audit on us. And there's something that you have to submit to the government. But sometimes these healthcare systems just don't have enough help or have enough practices or things in place to ensure that they actually mean these, these uh, requirements. So sometimes they're just getting, getting penalized or, or not hitting it, but they're usually audited by consultant firms and submitted uh, to the government and different people of, who are trying to who are trying to gain access to knowing where the healthcare system actually stands at that point in time. So there's an audit right. in place. Yeah. Usually. That's yeah. Awesome. And fortunately, fortunately, you mentioned something really important about documents, documentation. That's so key. Whenever whenever an auditor, um, whenever an auditor comes in, and I've been on both sides of it, where you ask you ask the the, the company. Can I see your documents for this, 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 and this, right? Whatever it may be. It might be an IRP, a DRP. It might be the controls that are in place. Are they doing the jobs properly? And sometimes they look at you like deer in headlights and they have no idea about documentation. They just say, oh, we have, we're have, we doing it. Well, how you prove, can you please prove that you're doing it? And in, in the HIPAA case, you know, the, the Office of Civil Rights, the OCR under HHS, they'll have, they'll contract or subcontract all these different auditing firms to go out and, you know, and they might surprise you. An audit could be, you know, it's like, it's like when you're audited from the IRS, now you're on their radar. So it might be every year or it might be every three years, depending. So unless you have that documentation to prove that you're doing the job that, you know, that they expect you to do, uh, that's, that's problems. And they, they might give you 30, 60, 90 days to, to shore up. But at that point, that's a lot to catch up on. All right, thanks. That's, that's great. Fortune, quick question. Um, you had mentioned that when they do the security assessments that um, they um, provide documentation to government. Were you referring to federal government or local government levels? Who's, who's the government that you're referring to? I was referring to federal. I think uh, uh, the, yeah, um, that's federal. O, federal. O, yeah, o, yeah, OCR and HS, OCR, H, 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 federal. Uh, yes, yeah. All those governments, I think, that's the that's where I was referring to federal level. And also, if you're using you're using um, you said like um, consultant auditors um, are, are they? If everyone can kind of maybe I misunderstood that you're using you don't necessarily have to use a standardized framework. If you're using different ones, do you just use an auditor that's familiar with that framework that you are using? I mean, is there any type of High, higher level standardization, especially if you're reporting to the federal level? Uh, I, uh, I'm trying to understand your question. So you're asking, is there any frameworks that these auditors are going against? Yeah. Uh, the other than what you're, right, other than the HIPAA, 
HIPAA one. I'm sorry. No, that would be the only. So they're only thing. using the HIPAA controls that you're mentioning. Yeah, they're HIP using HIPAA controls or anything else. That's uh, I know that was mentioned earlier, but it's usually mostly HIPAA controls. Yes, that's what they're using these healthcare organizations. Okay, thank you. Have you seen the? Have you seen it differently? Done differently? I, I've I've kind of just based on this week's question, I've asked some people who are in the um, who work as hospital administrators and worked in hospitals, and they gave me quite a little bit different story. So I, I was just trying to clarify what what I heard versus what you're explaining. What, what was the story they gave you? I mean, it's always a learning opportunity. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not going to contradict you. I'm sure you know more than they just work in, in a hospital, you know, yeah. on the different wards and administrative offices. Okay, no worries. Uh, uh, for, I the auditors and assessors, similar for, to how, um, like, we have it within this and everything. I will assume the consulting firms that are doing the auditing must also be somehow certified to issue um, or, car or to conduct assessments HIPAA related. I will assume that, right? I'm not sure. I don't know much about HIPAA. Similar to like the financial sector. So I have a quick question. That's correct. Is it that, a difference? That's correct. Is the difference trying to achieve regulatory requirements via compliance with HIPAA, but also there may be a layer of the cybersecurity um, assessment in general, like they go with every network that are also applied. Could it be like two, I don't wanna say two standards, but they're trying to achieve two different things, these network administrators. So maybe just going back to what Judy was saying, maybe that was the disconnect. I think if, from what I'm hearing, here and please correct me, Fortune. I think HIPAA is primarily data driven, where it only applies if you're dealing with like PHIs and it doesn't even expand to like networks and things like that, does it? I don't know. So, HIPAA, HIPAA, it deals with PHI, it's, it's a data driven framework, it deals with PHI and, e, and EPHI, stuff of that nature. But, um, when, it, when you talk about networks, of course, there's different networks that needs to be there's certain maintenance or requirements that needs to be in, in place when you're talking about transmitting the data between the networks that's when the networks actually come to play like how, how are we transmitting these data how are we processing it that's when networks and different things of that nature and systems will come in play nice. that's also uh dr wazir if you're doing if you're doing a hip assessment and you know uh, in my company does an assessment we don't do audits because then it's a conflict of interest but if we're doing an assessment on the hipaa uh, and the client will say, I need a full HIPAA assessment, then we're, we're doing a security rule, the privacy rule, the notification rule, because the security rule is more based on the data, which Fortune mentioned, you know, the, the data aspect of it. Uh, privacy rule is how information is being handled. This could be uh, paper-based, this could be, um, you know, uh, data-based. And then of course, the notification rule, if you are breached because of data mismanagement, what what are the steps you're taking to ensure that individual individuals know about it and also you're trying to mitigate as much loss as possible so um hipaa has like a hipaa has like a you know a checklist that you can go through all these different aspects uh but to 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 comment also on you know are, are they looking more for protecting their network from data or just checking off boxes that's where you should be mapping the hipaa assessment to a nist 853, um, you know, CSF, or even an ISO, depending if they're not an international company. So it's it's always good to follow two different frameworks because HIPAA is not a um, an all inclusive full fledged framework. Yeah, full fledged exactly. framework. Exactly. Yeah, and um, this. Well, this I mean, that's why we have that's why we have high tech. The purpose of high tech to sure. expand on the the implementation of the HIPAA since it was kind of like oh, we might need to protect this. It's a little bit important. Then it's really important. And then we'll implement NIST and ISO like you were talking about because it is extremely important, yeah. right? Exactly, exactly. Just looking yeah. from DOD perspective, I think uh, they have the overlays, right? The PHI and the financial. I'm not sure about the PHI, but I've seen the financial part done and they use the outsiders. Normally there's a special uh, assessors that come from external, pay extra amount of money. Uh, 
I, I'm thinking PHI would be the same as well, um, but I'm not sure. But again, just like how the HIPAA, the regulatory requirement with the financial, you'll have that glam, um, Graham Leach, Lily, whatever. Yeah, the called. GLBA thing. Yes, you'll have that. So I guess what I'm trying to say, and maybe we're all kind of saying the same thing, is that there's going to be a regulatory piece to it that's coupled with um, following best practices protection. Absolutely, because and, and a prime example of that is going to be if you're looking at HIPAA versus PIPAA, right? Like as a hospital, you have HIPAA, you have high tech, and then you have PIPAA if you have Canadian citizens, right? And those are all regulatory requirements. And there's even more, right? Those are just the ones I remember off the top of my head. It seems like we're all going through, all, like all of these are just the same type of pain. <laughs> it's a great discussion though. It's definitely yeah. Good. No, go ahead. Yeah, I want to say something. This is Franklin. Yeah, so um, uh, um, within the DOD, right, there is the Defense Earth Agency, right, that is pretty much I mean, responsible for, you know, protecting, you know, the many, you know, military hospitals, you know, across um, um, the United States and even um, um, overseas, right? And they do tailor, you know, the IPA requirements to, you know, um, their internally developed, you know, policies. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, you know, you look at access control, you know, encryption, data at rest in transit, you know, and even some of the system that, you know, um, the data sits on, right, you know, they have to follow certain um, requirements. I have not done any um, assessment with regards to IPA, but I know, I mean, some of the controls are very, very similar to, you know, at least 800.53, you know, the access control, you know, um, and things like that. So, I mean, within DOD, you have IPA and they have uh, internally developed um, policies, procedures that tailor back to, you know, um, the requirements in IPA. Over. That's correct. Yeah, that was a great discussion, guys. Very informative. I appreciate you guys for being engaged. So just wrap it up to get to the last slide, which is summary. Uh, the summary is basically um, healthcare security is focused on being free from danger slash life threat and risk. It's an indirect way of how we protect patient life or a patient health. Um, two, HIPAA focus on being secure and protected from the risk of loss, damage, unwanted modifications or other hazards such as fine or loss of trust. Having a loss of trust in organization is super big in general from cybersecurity, but imagine how some of these patients may feel, you know, hesitating to go somewhere because every time they go somewhere, they, they, they lose their patient information or their the organization is always, is always going through some type of data breach. Three, security is often, often achieved by means of several strategies undertaken simultaneously or used in combination with one another. And four is the role of management to ensure that security strategies are properly handled, properly planned, organized, staffed, directed, and controlled. So this is something that role of management needs to look into, especially those who are in the healthcare organizations or in leadership roles, to ensure that healthcare and security are on the same accord and are aligned and there's a, a clear balance on how they can work simultaneously to help each other uh, get to their common goal, which is protecting the patient and their data. So that's all I have. Do we have any other questions about the presentation that maybe anybody didn't want that wanted to ask or had any questions that did not get a chance to ask? Are we all good to go? Okay. Oh, this is great. Um, this is my first overview related to HIPAA. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Pass it back to you. Sure. Thanks. Um, and uh, you can uh, stop recording. Um, so yeah, everybody. Uh, 